That's me and Julia Child in 1979, when we worked together on Julia Child and More Company. Can you believe it? She was six foot two and I barely made it to five feet. Now, even though we didn't see eye to eye physically, we became great friends for 25 years. So, in tribute, I'm making fish meunier, the first dish Julia ate on French soil. And this is very un-Julia. I'll do it with just five ingredients. That's what we're aiming for today, five ingredient surf and turf recipes, like the steak with homemade butter. My brother Peter approves. When you start with the steak, this flavorful, mm, this flavorful. This is so good. It's a cinch. My salmon is oh so posh with its crispy skin and tangy Greek sauce. And hello, still only five ingredients. And on Ask Sarah. I can't quite get eggs Benedict right, so do you have any tips for poaching eggs? You're way ahead of the game. That's all coming up on Sarah's Weeknight Meals. Welcome to the French Chef. I'm Julia Child. That voice, who could forget it? But it was Julia's height that launched her career. During World War II, she tried to join the military, but they said she was too tall for the uniforms. So she joined the CIA, then called the OSS. They sent her to Sri Lanka and China, and there she met her husband, Paul, who introduced her to the pleasures of good food. But newlywed Julia couldn't cook a thing. Her true culinary epiphany came in 1948, when she and Paul moved to France. Welcome to Sarah's Weeknight Meals. I'm just about to make the dish that changed Julia's life. It was the first thing she ate when she moved to France with Paul. And Julia ordered, not knowing what she was ordering, I guess Paul must have helped her, sole meunier, which means literally sole in the style of the miller's wife. And where the miller's wife comes from is flour. So essentially it's fish dipped in flour, sauteed. But it was ethereal. So I'm gonna get started on this fish. We're using trout, because trout is just much more sustainable these days. I'm gonna pour some milk on here. Another trick I learned um, at cooking school and from Julia. Julia was French trained, as we know. Uh, after she had this iconic meal, she went on to go to the Cordon Bleu, not too long after that, because she wanted to cook the kind of food that she had eaten at this restaurant. And she learned all about French technique, and so did I. That was my training. But at any rate, one of the things that we learned is to pour, use milk as, eh, for better, better way to put it, as a deodorizer. So you have something that's strong in flavor, like fish or liver or game, you soak it in milk. Milk is also a tenderizer, but you don't really need to worry about that with fish, because fish is very tender. So I'm gonna park this in here. Let me just rinse my hands. And while that's soaking, I'm gonna go out and get some parsley in my garden because I want some fresh herbs. Okay, now we can cook the fish. Now I wanna point something out while we can see it. This is the pretty side of the fish. This is the not so pretty side of the fish. The not so pretty side is where the skin was. And the reason I bring this up is when you cook fish, you only flip it once. So you want the pretty side to be the last thing up. So you put the pretty side down when you put it in the pan. If you keep flipping the fish back and forth, back and forth, it will break, because fish is very delicate. It has no connective tissue. So salt and pepper. Now, Julia, in the classical way, would have been to use white pepper. White pepper for white things, black pepper for everything else with color. I don't like white pepper, so I'm sorry, Julia. I'm gonna use black. I can't help myself. Kosher salt and black pepper. So I just have to get this really, really hot. Tell you about Julia at Le Cordon Bleu. So she and Paul get to Paris and they find this cozy little apartment. Very cozy. I mean, Julia was a big person in a tiny kitchen and she wanted to cook for Paul. So it occurred to her to enroll in the Cordon Bleu. She only had GIs in the same program, all men. And then eventually she finished the whole program and she went back to take the exam and she didn't remember the recipes. She flunked. It was awful. She was devastated. 
There we go. And eventually, much later, she went back, she took it, she aced it. Yay, Julia. And I'm smelling it. One of the things Julia taught me was, usually when you smell it, it's almost done, or it is done. And this is particularly true with baking. I want to cut these lemons into sections because I'm going to add the whole sections to the sauce. So I'm going to take off the top and the bottom, and then we're going to go down either side. We're making what's called a sauce grenoise. It's a brown butter sauce, and it means in the style of Grenoble. And it involves lemons, capers, brown butter, and parsley. And fish absolutely cries out for acid, so you have to add acid. And because I am really smelling that fish, I'm going to go back over and see how we're doing. I'm, for once, I'm going to use a fish spatula for fish. Okay, when you flip it, you want to tip all the oil away from where you're flipping it so that you don't end up flipping it and getting the oil back up in your face. And then this one, I'm going to tip back this way. There we go. Isn't that beautiful looking? So I'm going to turn on my green beans. I'm going to start warming them up. So what you do is you go through the sections. Uh, I'm going to section it so you go through the membranes. You see the little white membrane there? You go on one side. OK. How do you know when fish is done? When the knife goes through easily. And that went through really easily. Here it's going to go through. It's done. And the second side never takes as long as the first side. So I'm going to get these out. Fish cooks from the outside in. So if you like your fish um, medium rare, then you want a little resistance when you put the knife through. And fish, like everything else, has carryover cooking time. So take it out before you think it's done. Let me get my butter in first. I'm going to do a couple of tablespoons. I'm sure that Julia would do more than a couple of tablespoons. But let me tell you something about Julia Child. Her motto was, everything in moderation. And she meant both of those words to be emphasized equally. So eat everything, just don't go hog wild with it. Oh, you can see the butter's getting wonderfully brown already. I'm going to put in my lemons. I'm going to work quickly. And some capers. Here we go. Capers are the pickled bud of a Mediterranean flower. I have no idea what genius stopped one day to look at these flowers and say, I'm going to go pickle that bud. I think that's a brilliant idea. OK. In go the capers. Ah, this is beautiful. My beans are ready. I like this piece, I think, the first one I did. There we go. On the plate, we have some beautiful potatoes. I was trying to think of an appropriate French name to call them, maybe pomme persiade. I don't know, but they were roasted and then just tossed with a little bit of parsley. Persiade means parsley. We like parsley. Maybe I'll put a few of those on the plate. And then last but not least, spoon over my sauce grinoblaws. This is a very Julia dish, I'm telling you. She loved her fish. Wow, doesn't that look delicious? Trout Munier in honor of Julia Child. Of all the hats I wear on Sarah's weeknight meals, this little segment here is my favorite, Ask Sarah. Today I have Narubi Balam from Austin, Texas. Hi. Hi, thanks so much for inviting me. Tell us a little bit about yourself. We rent chicken coops and backyard chickens for families here in Austin, Texas that want to enjoy fresh eggs. Because even, even with the freshest of eggs, um, I can't quite get eggs benedict right. So do you have any tips for poaching eggs? The very first thing you said, which is that you have fresh eggs, you're way ahead of the game. What happens when eggs are harvested is, like us, they start to go a little flabby. That white starts to separate out into a very watery part. I've strained this to get rid of the watery part of the white because then we will have a prettier looking 
poached egg. That's one of the things I didn't like when I made them, that they were watery. So that's yeah. perfect. Yes, because the watery whites give you those spidery edges. All right, so now how to poach. So what you do is you fill up a, you know, a straight-sided pan like this. I've got in here two and a half quarts of water that I brought to a boil, and I'm adding two and a half teaspoons of white vinegar. White vinegar helps the egg to set up so that you get fewer of those little strands. I break my eggs into ramekins so that they're very easy to just drop into the water. I'm going to turn off the water completely and then put the lid on. And two to two and a half minutes later, they'll be done. No swirl necessary? No swirl required. Okay, Naruvi, are you ready? Here we go ready. for the ta-da moment. Okay, ta-da. Oh, that looks awful. I only strained the one I showed you, and the other three must have been very old eggs. So I'm going to take the very pretty one. If you want to serve it right away, you just take it out while it's still hot. Just dry it on a, on a, a little napkin or, you know, side towel. And then I'm going to put it, this little guy, on top of a salad. Yikes. There we go. I hope that was helpful. I wish I'd had fresher eggs. Thank you so much. That was super helpful. Thank you. And for all of you there, send me your questions to the website. I would love to meet you this way and talk about your big issues in the kitchen. Every July 4th, my family has a New England tradition of cooking up whole sides of salmon, either grilled or baked with a buttery sauce. I mean, yummy, but I'm going to take my salmon this year in a different direction. I'm going to try to replicate that crispy skin that you get in restaurants. I just love it. And I'm going to top it with a Greek sauce. And guess what? It's going to be really exciting, it's going to be really tasty, and it's only five ingredients. Let's start with the salmon. So I have some in here. I've got some filet that we've cut into pieces, and it's been air drying for an hour. But we're gonna dry it out even more. The secret to crispy salmon is dry skin. You need the skin to be really, really, really dry. And I'm gonna pat it dry first heavily with paper towels. And then we're gonna get off any extra liquid by scraping all the way across. You can't maybe see it, but there's a tiny little bead. Not much, and that's because of all that air drying in the fridge. Most wild salmon comes from the Pacific Northwest. The only problem is it doesn't have a really high fat content. But now you can get organic, sustainably grown East Coast salmon that I find has a higher fat content. So I tend to like that. All right, I've been heating my pan for quite a while. I'm going to use grapeseed oil here, uh, about a tablespoon and a half. What we're looking for here is a high smoke point in your oil, because we need to cook the skin over very high heat. Oil should just shimmer when it's very hot, right before it smokes. That's how I know that it's hot enough for me to add the salmon. The second thing we're looking for is a sound that the fish is going to make when it hits the pan, a nice sizzle like that. Skin side down, because the point is to get the skin crispy. We're going to press it down, and we're going to do this several times. So you can see now that it's cooked from the bottom up about a quarter of the way. I know it's now time to pop it in the oven, but first, got to season it with a little salt and pepper. All right, I'm gonna go wash off my knife and I'm gonna make the sauce. It's a mayonnaise-based sauce, but the first ingredient is pepperoncini. I need about two tablespoons minced. Now, pepperoncini are Tuscan pickled peppers. However, I've never seen them in an Italian recipe. I've only seen them in Greek salads, but they're wonderful. They have brine, they have acid, and they have heat. And that's what they're gonna to bring to the sauce. I'm gonna add about a tablespoon of the pepperoncini liquid. Why not? It's got all that flavor in it. And one to two teaspoons of lemon juice. I'm just gonna eyeball it. Add that garlic that I minced earlier. And finally, a half a cup of mayonnaise. 
I am sure my fish must be done. So I'm gonna grab it out of the oven. Just gonna give it a quick touch. Oh yeah, all right, this is good. Oh, this looks so, so, so delicious. I think I've got the crispy skin I've been looking for. I'm gonna take this one here. I can see that there's a little bit of give, which means there's a little bit of medium rare in there. Now, skin side up, here we go. And we're gonna put our delicious sauce on there. And there you go, with my peas. And it's a little twist on the usual July 4th molten celebration. Five ingredients, who knew? There is nothing quicker to cook than a steak, and that's why it's the perfect candidate for a weeknight meal. Uh, you cook in no time at all, you let it rest, you take those juices, you make a sauce. So that's what I'm going to do right now, and I brought in some troops. My younger brother, Peter, he is my little brother, although clearly he got the better genes in the family. He happens to be a New York State Supreme Court judge, which I still can't believe. I mean, sometimes he's dignified, I don't know. But at any rate, you cook a lot. Yes. You cook steak a lot. Absolutely. I hope you learned something today. Well, I brought you a secret weapon. What? Actually, I brought you three secret weapons. Oh, dear. This what? This is from, I grew these on my terrace. This is a ahi dulce pepper, which is... Oh, I love those. those I know are, those. That's more like fruity. This is like a habanero without the heat. It's got all the fruit and the mango-ness. I love these. This is a black Czechoslovakian, which is, you know, roughly around a serrano pepper's heat. Heat? Okay. But then this one. Yeah? What's that one? I, I don't recognize that one at all. It's the famed and feared... Uh, ghost pepper four times or ten times I think the habanero oh dear I think heat. I think we'll put this guy will go over here I'm just I'm just gonna get him out of the way yeah don't even look at him yeah there we go uh, but we're gonna use the ahi dolce let me get the steak let's get started what so kind of steak you well have? we're using a different cut of steak so here's what I'm gonna have you season this on both sides okay and then we can hose down on the water back there so it's salt salt pretty nicely. Uh, so this is a Denver steak. There's other wonderful steaks that you can get now. A petite tender, a flat iron. I'm going to put this in the fridge and explain why in a second that we salt that ahead of time. Um, guess what we're going to make that you've never made before. I know you haven't. We're going to make butter. Or Julia would say, butter. Um, but uh, briefly, why you salt the steak ahead of time? If you salt a steak beforehand, it tastes really steaky. If you salt it after you've cooked it, it tastes like steak with a salt hat. Up to four hours is great why we refrigerated it. You want to pop that back in the use, fridge? If you use truffle salt, would it like yes. infuse it with truffle flavor? Brilliant. Like you did before? I like the way you think. Right. So we're going to use heavy cream to make this butter. It takes 12 minutes on a stand mixer. So we're gonna, I'm going to turn this on, let it rip, and we're gonna go have a cup of coffee. Oh, good. Yeah, okay. Wait, there we go, so let's go over here. Over here. Wow, see, look at this. It starts splattering when it uh, gets this far. Isn't that a miracle? Isn't that fun? Oh my God. But you see how, um, let me just move this over here. You see how watery it is? Yeah. I'm going to just get, lose this, and if you could just move the machine, and then sure. we're going to clean the butter. Okay. You know, the first time I made butter, I was so excited. It looked like this. I was like, wow, I did it, I did it. Okay. So I just threw it into a little ramekin, and um, the next day, I went to reach for it, and it, well, it was a couple days later, and it was stunk because you need to get rid of all these milk solids that are in there, or it turns bad. So we're going to wash it. So I got enough butter out. You'll do better. So what you have to do, and I'm going to let you do this, okay. is you knead it with your hands. You just keep squeezing the butter in the water. We'll change the water several times. We keep squeezing it and washing it until the water is clear. Okay, so while you do the last round, I'm just going to mince our little ahi dolce. Put the butter in here. Put the bowl in the sink Got it. and hose down. Okay. And I'll finish chopping these. And I'm gonna mince some garlic. What we're gonna do now is make steak butter. What we're gonna do is add to that, you're gonna add about a tablespoon 
Uh, Worcestershire. Worcestershire. Yeah, here's, here's this. Okay. Okay. And then you're going to add a half a tablespoon of Dijon, a half a teaspoon of garlic, some of our chilies, and then just a tiny bit of salt, a quarter teaspoon. Okay, so now what you do, this is sort of fun. We'll just do this much butter. That looks good. And you sort of shape it, smooth it out, and then you use the parchment. You want to just yeah. twist, twist in the ends like sure. a party it's favor? Like more yeah. Coffee, yeah. yeah, there you go. Isn't that fun? Yeah. Now what you do is you pop these in the freezer. And uh, then anytime you need them, we have one that we've already chilled. Very good. Isn't that fun? Um, we've had one that we've already chilled. I'm going to take that out in our steak that I salted earlier before you came to make sure it had more time with the salt. So here's some butter that we made before. So let's get this started. Okay. This is um, actually a nonstick pan, but this is one that really retains the heat, so we're going to get a nice sear on our steak. What kind of oil do you use? Grape seed oil, uh, which I like because it's so neutral, because we're going to have plenty of flavor otherwise. So, um, but also, isn't it, uh, it can stand higher heats. Good point. Thank you. You do know a thing or two. Once from, you know, <laughs> just from watching you. No, no, that's not true. I'm just patting these dry, and we'll wait till that's really good and hot, and then we'll get them. Oh, Pete, you want to do some pepper yeah, for yeah, me? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. On both sides. Does the pepper burn at all? Do you worry about that or not? No, really? pepper's okay. Now, a couple of important things about searing steak is that it's got to be really, really dry. If it isn't, it will sweat and you won't get that sear. We want that nice crust. The pan has to be very hot. We need to hear sound when we get it in there. I think that's good. We're going to give it about two, three minutes aside. Uh, we, we don't turn it until you can feel it move. That means it's already got that crust, and you don't want to turn it or mess with it too much because that cools down the pan and it won't seal properly. Oh, that's beautiful. Isn't this? So we're going to give them a couple minutes aside. You know, for rare, we're looking at 120 degrees, and then we're going to let them rest because you need to let the juices redistribute, even in something as small as the steak, because if we took these out and ate them right away, all the juices come streaming out. Doesn't it smell wonderful? It smells great. Yeah. So you want to put the foil on yep. top of there. Let's turn this off. All right. Okay. Oh boy, I think we're, doesn't that look so delicious? We're going to save those juices and pour them over the steak along with the butter. So let's see. Let's take the thicker one, right? Okay. It's not a very pronounced grain, is it? No, no. But you were saying that you thought it was going this way. I think so. Okay. So we're going to. Oh, that's uh, very nice. No, okay, we're so we're going to cut it this way. All right, and we're going to cut it thin. And again, the whole point is that if you don't have a, a sharp knife, this is not going to work. It's going to be hard to cut the steak. Do we need this piece right here? Because I just think I can do this. I, oh, dear. Okay. Now, I want you to comment on the salt. Mm. Now, what oh, is it? Man. It tastes like a beautifully that's seasoned a, steak, it's right? It's got a lot of flavor. Now, we're going to pour our juices over. Here we go. You don't want to waste these ever. Ooh, that's the best stuff. And then we're going to put our butter on top, and it will slowly melt. I'm going to just cut it a little bit more. And then I'm going to have you lift up those chilies. OK. All right, so sprinkle those all on top. You like to dine al fresco, you New York City person? Of course, you always eat on your patter and When patio. I cook, I like to call myself al fresco. <laughs> Okay, you grab that, okay. and I'm going to grab this beautiful salad, and let's head outside. All right. Will you pour the wine? I think we got a coat de Rhone there. Wow, this looks so, look at all that wonderful juice. This is very colorful. I don't always. It's fantastic. Oh, yeah. Oh, yum, yum. All righty. Well, I want you to take a little bite of that butter, too, and tell me what you think straight up of the butter. Okay. Yes. Um, and I want to thank you all for joining us. When you start with a steak, this flavorful, mm, this flavorful. This is so good. It's a cinch. Mm. I'm Sarah Moulton here with my brother, Judge, Peter Moulton. Thanks so much for joining us, and I hope mm. you join us again for more of Sarah's Can Weeknight of Meals. <laughs> you can. There's plenty left. The Very butter good. is amazing. Isn't it? Isn't it? Homemade butter just can't be beat, really. That's incredible. Mm. And that deeply flavored steak. Mm -hmm. wow. Did you
choice. Mm. 